This is going to be when life looks like the tribulation. So go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 1. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So this sets the context of Matthew 24. What we are about, about to read is Jesus Christ telling the Jewish disciples what shall be the sign of his coming and of the end of the world. So we're going to see a description of the end, the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. And instead of focusing so much on the doctrine, I'm going to talk very practical and talk about when life looks like the tribulation. When life looks like the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, there is no doubt that Christians are going through tribulation today. Rev Romans 5, 3 says, But we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tr tribulation worketh patience. Ephesians three thirteen says, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Second Thessalonians 1, 4, So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and your faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. We aren't going to go through the time period that people refer to as the tribulation, which is the time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. Uh, here in America, we may not be dying as a martyr, but we are going through persecution and tribulation in other ways. Not to as great of an extent as people in other countries who are dying for Jesus Christ. But there's still persecution. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And in the time of Jacob's trouble, there is going to be great tribulation unlike anything the world has ever seen. And while nothing we are going through is anything like that, when we are in the middle of our storm, in our mind, we think it's that bad. We think we have it worse than anyone has ever had it and that anyone will ever have it. So this is going to be when life looks like the tribulation. Uh, number one, life resembles the tribulation when people deceive you. Matthew 24, 4 and 5 says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Then go down to verse 11. It says, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Now I'll go down to verse 23 and 24. And you're going to see that a major theme in the time of Jacob's trouble is deception. Matthew 24, 23 and 24 says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. There is going to be great deception during that future time period. Second Thessalonians 2.11 says that God shall send them strong delusion, and they are going to be tricked. They are going to have the wool pulled over their eyes, and they are going to be lied to. And this happens in the life of Christians as well today. Uh, Paul says over and over, Be not deceived. He says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The devil deceives you when he says you can sin and get by with sinning. He deceives you when he says you can sin and not face any consequences here in the flesh. You can't sin and get by. But the devil tells you that you can and he tells you that you should do this or do that because everyone else is doing it. Uh, your flesh tries to tell you that you can sin and get by. The world tells you you can sin and get by. Other people will tell you that you can sin and get by, but they are deceiving you. In the time of Jacob's trouble, 
the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to show signs and lying wonders that will deceive many. Companies and other people do this today. They show signs and lying wonders. The beer companies do this today. They show a fantasy world on their billboards and their commercials where you're cool if you drink or get drunk. They'll say you have more friends. Uh, the celebrities and rap artists are doing the same thing. They make you think that sin makes you cool and popular. And Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe well, unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Uh, that is the world's theme today, calling something that's evil good and calling something good evil. Uh, we are living in a time today where people call bad things good things and good things bad things. If they like something or think something's cool, they say, that's wicked or she's bad or that's lit. Ever heard someone say that's lit? Something being lit is not good. That's bad. Uh, the rich man in hell is lit. Uh, fire in the Bible is mostly not associated with something good. Uh, people's works at the great white throne judgment or at the judgment seat of Christ, if your motive for your good works wasn't right, then that stuff's going to get burned up. Uh, fire is associated with sin and judgment and hell in the Bible. Being lit is not a good thing. But what do people say? They say, that's lit. Uh, the devil is working hard to deceive you and your kids into thinking the Bible is boring and that it's for old people and all the wicked stuff is fun and for young people. You can see this on all the TV shows. Like The Simpsons, they got the nerdy older guy who loves the Bible, is supposed to be a Christian, and that's to deceive the world and the millions of people who watch that to think Christianity is boring and nerdy. Uh, there are going to be false prophets in the time of Jacob's trouble going out into the world to deceive people. There has always been false prophets and always been false teachers. Uh, today there are fake TV evangelists suckering people and old ladies out of their money every day. And sometimes we get duped. Sometimes someone leads us astray and this is when life resembles a major aspect of the time of Jacob's trouble is when we are deceived. We need to read the Bible and pray and stay in close fellowship with God so that we don't get deceived. But moving on, number two, life resembles the time of Jacob's trouble because of fighting and bickering. Uh, Matthew 24, 6 and 7 says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. There has always been wars and rumors of wars, but in that future time period, it will be vamped up, and people will will hear about them more because of the advanced technology and communication. They'll hear about it on Facebook, on TV. And your life resembles this when you are constantly at war with another person. Is your whole life about wars and rumors of wars? Uh, lately, all I hear is wars and rumors of wars. Uh, this camp of independent fundamental Baptists are biting at the throats of another camp of independent fundamental Baptists. They're arguing and warring over doctrine. If someone says, if, one, if a preacher says one thing that they don't like, then they go to war with that person. And then if you watch preaching on Facebook or listen to it on Sermon Audio, then you see all-out war going on. They are arguing over doctrine, slandering each other verbally, just verbally demolishing one another. Uh, it's getting close to physical stuff, though. Uh, the lost people are the casualties in the war. There are suicide bombers from both sides uh, putting their reputation on the line, committing suicide with their testimony 
so they can stick their neck out to defend not the Lord Jesus Christ, but their doctrine, their pet doctrine that they have. It's not to defend the Lord Jesus Christ or to help God in any way. It's to help their denomination or their, their camp. Galatians 5.15 says, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Ephesians 4.32 And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Show me where Paul is constantly going at the throat of someone else. It seems like he's always saying to love the brethren, be tender-hearted, forgive one another, be kind to each other. Paul teaches we are to love each other, treat each other right, pray for each other. One of the fruits of the Spirit is love, not hate. Uh, there are some things we need to hate, but many preachers and Christians are really overemphasizing the hate word. Uh, sure, you have to hate to love. If you love the Lord, you hate evil. But these guys who are at war hate everything and hate, hate everybody. And there is... There is nowhere in the Bible where it says it's okay for you to hate your brother and sister in Christ. If you love the Lord, you hate evil. But you don't hate your brothers and sisters in Christ. They're in the body of Christ, and you're members of the same body. But a lot of these guys are angry and bloodthirsty. They want to take out the well-known preachers so they can sit on the throne as the greatest. They want their camp to be considered the best. And there is too much friendly fire going on. You need to shoot the enemies, the devil, the spiritual wickedness in high places, and not your own team. Matthew 24, 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. So famines. In the time of Jacob's trouble... They're going to be thirsty. They're going to be hungry. They're not going to have anything to eat. And today, what do we have a famine of today for Christians? Many of you have a self-inflicted famine of the things of God and the words of God. The words of God is available, but you're starving yourself to death when it comes to the things of God and the word of God. Pestilences. You have a sin plague and you're spreading it to others because no man liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. When you sit down on the couch and watch wicked stuff on TV and your kid comes out of their room and walks by and sees you watching it, you're affecting them. You're plaguing them with your sin. Uh, you have earthquakes in diverse places because that sin is shaking your world in ways you never thought it would. And I hope your life doesn't resemble that horrible future time period in that aspect. In Matthew 24, 8, it says, All these are the beginning of sorrows. Just when you think the storm in your life can't get any worse, and all that stuff has just happened, you find out that these are only the beginning of sorrows. And some, that's how the storm is. It gets, it gets bad. Matthew 24, 9 says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. In the time of Jacob's trouble, God's people are going to be unbelievably persecuted and martyred, and they're going to hate them just because they love Jesus Christ. You can already see it today, how things are going that way, where shows like Family Guy and Saturday Night Live mock and make fun of the Lord Jesus Christ, make, make Christians look stupid, and they think that we're the only thing in the way from them being their own final authority and, being, and doing what they want to do in this life. They think that we're holding them back because they can't be just sodomites everywhere and have tra transgender everywhere and go to whatever bathroom they want to go to. They think that we're the ones holding them back from a good life. But they're going to find out the pleasures of sin only last for a season. Matthew 24, 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. 
in that future time period, the time of Jacob's trouble, there will be saints who betray other saints to keep their own head. Uh, an Antichrist minion may come to them and say, tell me where your friend is or your son is, and I won't chop your head off for not taking the mark. But even today, life resembles the tribulation with the betrayal and the hatred of Christians towards other Christians. They're at war with each other. I've never seen the like of people being jealous and hateful towards other Christians. They don't have the attitude of saying, good job, man, I'm proud of you for what you're doing. They say in their heart, why is all these good things happening to him? It could be happening to me. I'm doing a lot better than he is. I can do it a lot better than he is. You do know that when you sit and think in your head about how you can do better than another person, that that's a sin. That's a sin in itself. And Matthew twenty four eleven says, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. So in the time of Jacob's trouble, they want feel-good preaching. They want to feel good. They're going to have itching ears. In the last days of the church age, they're going to have itching ears. People already have that now. They want feel-good preaching. They want somebody like Joseph Prince and all these ultra-grace people that basically teach you can do whatever you want to do and have no consequence. Matthew twenty four twelve says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The love in the time of Jacob's trouble is going to be almost non-existent. It will be lust. It will be a fake-like Valentine's Day love. Uh, it will be a perverted sodomite love. It will be unnatural affection. Just like people already have today, they already have unnatural affection. You have women who would rather see a newborn baby suffocate in a hot car rather than they would a poodle suffocate in a hot car. And I'd rather every dog on the planet turn into hot dogs in a hot car somewhere than for one baby to die in a hot car. Human life is worth more than animal life by far. But people's love for other people, even in this present day, has grown cold because of iniquity. But it's nothing like it will be. But right now is the worst it's ever been so far. But it's nothing like it will be in that future time period. People are getting worse and worse. And they'd give up their kid for adoption before they'd keep it. They'd abort it. They'll murder it. Uh, you have planned murder and planned parenthood. Iniquity abounds, the love waxes cold. The more you sin and get that sin ingrained in you, the more you're going to hate. And the more it desensitizes you and make you a flesh-pleasing, self-worshipping, sin-loving, God-hating pervert. Uh, you could get to a point where you'd kill somebody to please that sick, disgusting flesh. Aren't you sick of that flesh? Don't you want to get it under control? How can these sex trafficking, child molesting perverts live with themselves after they commit these horrible acts of sin on young kids? It's disgusting. It's because their love has grown cold and they are only out for pleasing the flesh. They hate you and they hate your kid. The devil hates your kid. The only thing these people care about is satisfying the desires of the flesh. Do you ever feel like you aren't going to make it to the end because your life resembles the tribulation? You feel like you can't endure until the end? 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. All those afflictions you're going through Somewhere, someone is going through the same thing, and they are making it. The saints in the past have made it, so you can make it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, Therefore hath no temptation taken you, but such is as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye, sh ye may be able to bear it. So you can make it to the end. You can make it to the end of this, whatever you're going through. Matthew twenty four thirteen and 14 says, But he that shall endure unto the end, 
the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. But notice it says, But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. In the time of Jacob's trouble, they're going to have to get to the end, not the end of their life, but the end of that time period, without taking the mark or die as a martyr before the end. And it's going to be really hard to make it to the end. Just like it can be really hard for us to make it to the end of whatever we're going through. But knowing that others have went through it, people are going to go through it, that can show us that they're just human, we're human, we can also make it through it. But next, life resembles the tribulation when you defile the holy place. Matthew twenty four fifteen says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. In the time of Jacob's trouble, the Antichrist is going to show his fangs. He's going to resurrect from the dead, stand in the holy place, and claim to be God. And this is made possible because God goes back to having a temple for his people, a building. Right now, God has his people as a temple. In 1 Corinthians six eighteen through 20, it says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. But it says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? If you are born again, then your body is the temple. God has his people for a temple today. It isn't like in the Old Testament where God has a temple for his people and in the time of Jacob's trouble where God has a temple for his people. It's completely different. But your body is the holy place. God lives in you. And if you are doing things like committing fornication, then you're sinning against your own body which is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And your life resembles something that will take place in the time of Jacob's trouble because the Antichrist is going to sit in the holy place, a literal building, and defile it. And you're defiling the temple like Cam when you do things like commit fornication. I hope your life doesn't resemble that time period in that aspect. And that's a way that we know we're not going through the time of Jacob's trouble. Because... If God's going to go back to having a temple, a building for his people, but yet our body is the temple, that doesn't make any sense. The Antichrist can't stand in you. He has to stand in a literal building. But Matthew twenty four sixteen says, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. The Jews are going to run away. They don't want to get their heads chopped off. They are fleeing temptation. They don't want to be in a situation where they're going to take the mark of the beast to keep their family alive and themselves alive. We need to do the same thing. We need to flee temptation every day. And we can bear the temptation. There's always a way to escape it. But they're going to be them in Judea fleeing to the mountains. Notice it says in Judea. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. Uh, but you still have a sin nature. And every sin you commit, you did that sin by choice. A Calvinist said to me one time, if I have free will, then why can't I stop sinning? Well, every sin you do, you do it by choice. You chose to do it. Uh, you chose to smoke a cigarette. You chose to drink beer. You chose to fornicate. You chose to cuss. You chose to watch something dirty on TV. You make choices all throughout your day. Uh, Matthew twenty four seventeen through 19 says, Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. If you're going through your storm and your heart is heavy, having a kid at that time can make it more tough because your heart is also heavy for them. Imagine going through the literal time of Jacob's trouble with kids, you're going to be more tempted to take the mark to feed them. You, it's going to be harder to hide them. Imagine having a baby in the time of Jacob's trouble and having to keep it quiet 
when the Antichrist and Antichrist henchmen are coming after you trying to cut your head off because you didn't take the mark of the beast. You need to get saved today before it's too late. Matthew twenty four twenty says, But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Notice, the Sabbath comes back in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's strange, because Paul tells us we don't have to keep the Sabbath. That's for the Jew. If you read the book of Exodus, God says it's, it's a sign between him and Israel. I'm not Israel. I don't keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath isn't for the church, it's for Israel. The church will go out in a rapture and God will go back to primarily dealing with the Jews. That's why the Sabbath comes back. That's why the temple worship comes back. Matthew twenty four twenty one says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no nor ever shall be. So during this future time there's going to be such tribulation that the world has never seen anything like it. And that reminds me of times in my life where I thought I was going through something that nobody ever went through in their life. I thought I was going through the worst time than anyone has ever went through on earth. I thought I had it worse than any person ever had it or ever will have it. But a person in that future time period will really be able to make that statement. But remember, no matter what you're facing, there is somebody somewhere going through the same thing. And if you're feeling sorry for yourself and you think you have it bad, then read about some Christian martyrs in other countries right now. You see, these guys, they think we've got to go through the tribulation because Christians aren't facing persecution and martyrdom. But they must think that the world revolves around them here in America and going to church every Sunday. The world doesn't revolve around you. There's other countries with Christians who are being martyred and persecuted for their faith. But if you're feeling sorry for yourself and think you have it bad, then read about them Christian martyrs in other countries. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Think about how much God has blessed you, and you'll start feeling better. Matthew twenty four twenty two says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. If you want to shorten your days because of sorrow in your life, then get busy for God. Redeem the time because the days are evil. If you get busy for God, then time will fly so fast that you won't even have time to think about yourself or your depression. And it will literally seem like time has been shortened. I know that since I've been saved, it seems like time has sped up. And the, the last seven years that I've been saved does not seem like seven years. Matthew twenty four twenty five and 26 says, Behold, I have told you before, wherefore if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. In the time of Jacob's trouble, they are going to be saying, Jesus is here. He's over there. Jesus is this guy. Jesus is that guy. There will arise false Christs, but they won't be Christ. They'll think the Antichrist is Jesus Christ. That is part of the deception. Uh, but Jesus is my hope. He's my king. He's my way, the truth, the life, my happiness. But you know your life resembles the tribulation when someone tells you you can find your hope, your way, your truth, and your happiness by looking over here and looking over there and looking at this person. Looking somewhere else other than where Jesus Christ really is. And in the time of Jacob's trouble, they're going to be saying he's in the desert. He's in the secret chambers. Today they are telling you your hope is in drugs. Your hope is in sex. It's in music. It's in a good career the, or in the American dream. And that all goes along with the deception. That's why Paul continuously says to Christians, be not deceived. So life resembles the time of Jacob's trouble at times. But there is good news because the tribulation ends so the sorrow ends, the depression ends, the storm ends. Matthew twenty four, twenty seven says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. 
Jesus will come by and give you the victory over the, over sin. He'll give you comfort in times of trouble. He'll show you the way when there is no way. He's coming back to get you at the rapture, which isn't in Matthew 24. The pre-tribulation rapture is nowhere in Matthew 24. The pre-trib rapture for the church is in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. Now what's in Matthew 24 is the second coming. And that's what you read in Matthew 24, 27, where it says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even into the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And the same way Jesus Christ is going to come back at the second coming, is the same way He'll come down and be with you in your situation. The pre-tribute rapture is our hope. It's our comfort. We need to comfort one another with these words. It's a comfort knowing that we're going to meet the Lord in the air. But when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming with His saints, that's when the literal tribulation, time of Jacob's trouble ends. He's coming back with a sharp two-edged sword and it will be, it'll be over. Matthew twenty four twenty eight says, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. God said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And the God-haters are literally for the birds here. In Matthew twenty four twenty eight, the eagles are going to eat them for dinner. That's the supper of the great God. Matthew 24, 29 through 31 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now the elect here isn't the elect of Colossians 3.12, the body of Christ. Isaiah 45.4, you have the elect which is Israel. But one day all the saints from every age will worship God together. Here in Matthew 24.31, the elect isn't the body of Christ, which is every born again believer, no matter... Uh, what denomination they are, or what state they may actually be in. Every born-again believer makes up the body of Christ, and we are elect, but we're not the elect of Matthew twenty-four thirty-one. That is Israel, the elect of Isaiah 45, 4. One day all the saints from every age will worship God together without fighting and bickering, without trying to be the greatest, without shooting each other down. There won't be any camps or division. It will all be praise, glory, and honor to God. And He is going to gather together in one all things in Christ. Life will no longer resemble the tribulation. It won't resemble something that is without form and void. Matthew twenty four thirty two through 33 says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when its branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves. You know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, Know that it is near even at the doors. These things in this chapter have always been going on. There has always been wars and famines and earthquakes and pestilences. But when you shall see all these things mentioned in this chapter, the saints during that time are going to know it's getting close. And when all these things are coming down on your head today, all the sorrows and the storms that come down on your life, remember there is a better day coming Know that it is near, even at the doors. Uh, Matthew twenty four thirty four says, Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And there is something to lean on when your life resembles the time of Jacob's trouble. All the things of this world are going to pass away, but God's word is fixed. It can't be destroyed. It will never pass away. And if you get in that book, then you have something in your hands that you have access to 24 hours a day that is real. It's not a rumor. It's not fake. It's not a strong delusion. It's not deceiving. It's there for you to eat and live off of. Esteem the words of his mouth more than your necessary food. The Bible says, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God shall man live. It says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It talks about how we should labor in the word and doctrine. It says, Give attendance to reading. Uh, the Bible is something to lean on during times of trouble. Uh, Matthew twenty four thirty six says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Nobody knows when the second coming, the revelation, will be. I don't know when it will be. God knows. Just like God knows when your storm is coming and will it will, when it will be over. God knows when good times are coming and when the good times leave and the bad times come. God's in control and take comfort in the fact that He sees the end from the beginning. He knows what you're going through. He knows how to get you out of it. He knows why He put you in it. Matthew twenty four thirty seven through 39 says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Just like the ungodly men in Noah's day didn't see the storm coming, you don't see the storm coming. Noah was prepared for the storm. He was right with God before the storm came. And if you really want to be prepared, then get right when you're not in the storm. Then when one comes, it will be easier for you to call on God. If you're already walking with God and talking with God, reading the Bible and fellowship with, every, with Him every day, and out of nowhere a storm comes, you're already going to be right and can go straight to God. You don't have to say, Oh God, I'm sorry for living wicked and doing all these bad things. I should have been closer to you. You're already close to Him. And it will be so much easier to call on Him. Matthew twenty four, forty through 44 says, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the meal, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And there was going to be people in the time of Jacob's trouble who aren't ready for Jesus Christ to come down and plant his feet on the dirt. Some will think they are prepared as they hide in the dens and rocks of the mountains. They think they can hide from the line of the tribe of Judah. But they'll say, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And they'll pray to the, to the rocks to fall on them. Matthew twenty four forty five and 46 says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. So the one who's ready is praised. Are you ready? Are you going to be ready when you need to be ready? If you're saved, then you're ready for all these end times events. But are you ready for the storm that is definitely going to come in this present life before you die? Uh, Matthew twenty four forty seven and 48 says, Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint, appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you've been born again, then you're ready for judgment day. You're prepared for eternity. You're not going to hell. You're not going to weep and gnash your teeth like this person in Matthew twenty four fifty one. But are you living it up right now in this life? And are you unprepared for when that storm comes? Are you just worried about fulfilling the desires of the flesh and going out and partying and drinking with your friends? Uh, they're going to... If you're doing that, you're going to be sorry that you weren't prepared when that storm comes. Maybe that storm's coming because you're in the shape that you're in right now. You think life is all good sometimes when you're 
enjoying the pleasures of sin that last for a season, but you, there's something in you telling you that you need to get right, and you need to be and you're ashamed of what you're doing. The Bible says, What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Do what you need to do today to stay right with God. Then when trouble comes, your heart will be soft and your heart will be right and you'll know exactly what you need to do because it will, it will be a part of your everyday routine already. But these wicked people during that time of Jacob's trouble that's coming who are lost and eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and that in that time are going to think they have all the time in the world. They're going to think the Lord delayeth His coming, as the verse said. Then Jesus Christ is going to come in a day that they aren't looking for Him. They are unprepared. And we all need to be prepared for something. If you're not saved, and the Bible tells you how to be saved. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, Paul gives us the gospel. He says how that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Notice it says Jesus Christ died for our sins. Notice you can't give the gospel out without saying the word sin. You have all these people who go around saying, don't mention sin, just mention grace and love. But you can't tell somebody how to get saved without telling them what they need to get saved from. You need to be saved from sin. And Jesus Christ became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. You're ungodly, you're a sinner, your sins are going to take you to hell. you got to get the sins under the blood. Colossians 1.14 says, "...in whom we have redemption..." Through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus Christ died for your sins. He shed His blood. He was buried and He rose again the third day. The resurrection proves He's God. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.16, For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Jesus Christ is God in flesh. That's how He can save. He's the only perfect sacrifice that there is and to be saved you have to accept him as the payment for sin jesus christ paid for our sins on the cross if you want to be saved put your trust in that if you want to go to hell trust something else Acts 16 1 says believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved romans 10 13 says for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved there's only one way, and Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Any other way, you're just getting there as a thief and a robber. You ain't going to make it. You're going to go to hell. Uh, you're not just going to die physically, but you're going to die a second time. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So one day you're going to die physically, and then one day you're going to be called, after you, you've been in hell for who knows how long, at least a thousand years at this point, you're going to be called up to the great white throne judgment. God's going to show you your name isn't in the book. He's going to show you all the wicked works you've done. And then he, he He's going to tell you, Depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire. And that's the second death. You're going to die twice. Uh, that's why people say, if you're born once, you die twice. If you're born twice, you die once. You're born the first time out of your mother. And then the second time, if you get born a second time, you get born again. And you get born again by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. He that believeth on the Son hath life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son is condemned already, because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. So if you want to be saved, if you want to know that you're going to heaven, and know that you don't have to face the time of Jacob's trouble, Come to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner that you are and believe on Him as your payment for sin.